on Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, my name is Bill Fletcher. I'm the uh, executive editor of globalafricanworker.com. It is my honor and pleasure to be the host of today's discussion. Uh, just a few things. We have three wonderful panelists who will be each speaking for roughly 10 minutes, uh, providing some background and, and focus. And then we're going to have uh, essentially a talk show format where I will be interviewing them. We'll be going back and forth and discussing uh, a number of these issues. You are, are free to uh, offer questions or comments, and we will do our best. We can't promise it. We will do our best to respond to them. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, you know, the, 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 the ongoing uh, nearly 80-year uh, crisis in the region known as Jammu and Kashmir, bordering uh, India, Pakistan, China, this crisis has been a global flashpoint. And when you have a situation with two nuclear armed powers that are within minutes of annihilating each other, the crisis and the issues that are at stake in the Jammu and Kashmir become very, very important, not just for the region, but for the entire world. But on top of that, there are issues that simply don't get discussed in the Western media. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to have this discussion. And I very selfishly am incredibly interested in seeing much more of this discussed in, for, with viewers in the United States who know very little about what's going on and, and have no sense of the background. And so we're going to engage in this. Now, what has catalyzed this discussion in some respects were the, uh, the almost unprecedented, and I say almost, unprecedented moves by the Modi government of India, the, the BJP is a party, dominant party, to in effect annex Jammu and Kashmir in clear violation of an agreement that had been arranged with the people of that region back in the 1940s. Uh, one of our speakers will give us some background on this. And what's striking, striking about this is that the audacity of this move has met with little international response. We have to figure out why that is and what needs to be done today. In order to do this, uh, again, my honor to introduce our panelists. I'll say very briefly uh, something about each of them. Our, our first speaker will be Mohammed Janaid, who is an assistant professor at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. He has a PhD in anthropology with research on violence, nationalism, culture, and politics in South Asia. He has written extensively on the military occupation, history, space, and pol political subjectivity in Kashmir. And one of the things that we will be posting is a timeline that he developed that's very, very useful. Uh, regardless of how much you think you know about Jammu and Kashmir, this is just a really important document to have. Second uh, speaker, Mom, uh, excuse me, Mona Ban, is a Ford Maxwell professor of South Asia and associate professor of anthropology at Syracuse University in New York State. She is the author of Counterinsurgency Development and the Politics of Identity, From Warfare to Welfare. She's a co-author of Climate Without Nature, Critical Anthropology of the Anthropocene and co-editor of Resisting Occupation in Kashmir. Our third speaker is the journalist Pervez Bukhari, a senior journalist who is based in Kashmir. We're honored to welcome each of those, uh, uh, those panelists. And I want to start, Mohammed Janet, if you could start with your opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. Um, I just want to express my gratitude to Global Dialogue for hosting us today. Um, so I'll just go straight to the point. Um, I will give you a little bit of a historical background to the events uh, that occurred last year. Um, and I just want to frame those the history uh, not simply as like a progressive uh, movement of events from one to another, but give you a larger context of why things are happening the way they are. Um, so uh, last year on August 5, 2019, that is, uh, India's Home Minister Amit Shah 
stood in the parliament and stated that he the indian government was going to read down uh, an article of the indian constitution called article 370 and revocate or uh, revoke uh, another article called 35a uh, these articles had been part of the indian constitution since uh, early 1950s and had been negotiated between the indian leaders and the pro india leadership i want to make that clear pro india leadership uh, within kashmir um uh, in the post 1947 scenario in an article in new york times the editor said that modi government's actions had brought history back as a warning that uh, we need not go back into history to understand uh, what what is wrong in kashmir that we should just move on um and i think that uh, that's a really sad reading of course of these events in kashmir um before the these moves were made the entire region was put under a lockdown a military siege and a communication blockade um all the political leaders from the the pro independence pro pakistan uh, leadership um, um had been put in jail already but the indian government also detained its own loyalist politicians you know who had been supporting indian position since 1947 uh and and this is their own people in kashmir and you can't imagine what the ordinary kashmiris uh who are seen in india um as internationals enemies uh, uh you know uh, were undergoing so let's just uh go back to why kashmir is the way it is and uh what are the claims that india makes on kashmir and whether they are valid or not um so uh we all know that uh the british left the indian subcontinent in 1947 in a haste um before that the uh, the indian lead the hindu leaders who uh, the indian leaders who were part of the international congress and the leaders of the muslim league led by jinnah had negotiated a uh, creation of india and pakistan um that story is pretty well known you know india got india pakistan got uh, pakistan but uh, there were several regions at that time which were uh, controlled not by the british directly but were under the authority of what are called the princely rulers um there were more than 500 of them and most of them chose to join uh india because they were given the choice whether to join india or pakistan and the choice was based to be based on uh their demographic composition whether they had a muslim majority or a hindu majority uh and the geographical contiguity whether their borders connected with it, the future pakistan or future india and now as i said most of these states joined with india because uh, of these two factors uh, there were three states hyderabad junagadh and kashmir which had a dilemma in hyderabad the ruler was a muslim and the majority were hindu in junagadh the ruler was a muslim and majority was a hindu in kashmir the state of jammu and kashmir the majority more than uh, 78 percent population was muslim but the ruler was hindu now in the case of hyderabad india uh, the ruler decided to waver and uh, not join india and the nehru government sent in military forces they called them that police action and absorbed uh, hyderabad state into the indian state uh, in junagadh uh, muslim ruler decided to join pakistan but india Uh, proposed that there should be a referendum a plebiscite in the region and the plebiscite was carried out and because it had a hindu majority they decided to join um, india in the case of kashmir india um, instead of accepting these principles that it had adopted in hyderabad and junagadh decided that um, you know it would ask the hindu ruler to accede to india despite the fact that kashmir had uh a uh, muslim majority and a demographic uh, uh, geographical contiguity with pakistan now uh the indian claim since 1947 uh, i'll go back into how things unfolded a little bit um the indian claim has been that uh, india kashmir is part of india because the hindu ruler of the time chose to um become part of uh india at that time while pakistani claim has been that the um the 
people of Kashmir, who were at that time called the state subjects, should be given the choice to whether join India or Pakistan. Now, of course, you know, um, Pakistani claim is a little more democratic because it, um, you know, wants plebiscite in Kashmir, wants to know the will of the people of Kashmir, which is a position um, that the United Nations took as well, that the will of the people of Kashmir should determine the final status um, of this, the region. But the Indian claim is purely based on this uh, document that is called the instrument of accession that was signed between the uh, Hindu ruler of the state and the Indian state. Now, in Kush uh, to, uh, I mean, you know, this is how historians from South Asia have typically understood the question. Now, from a Kashmiri perspective, there's an, this other undercurrent third uh, perspective, which is predominant in Kashmir. And they, uh, you know, uh, historically, we have understood ourselves as a, a region separate both from India and Pakistan. We have a, a continuous history from a pretty long time um, and our aspirations before 1947 were different. We were not directly controlled under by the British. The, and we also claim that the, uh, our struggle before 1947 was neither to join India or Pakistan, nor was it necessarily an anti-colonial movement, although Kashmiri leadership did express solidarity with um, uh, anti-colonial strugglers uh, across the region. Uh, but it was primarily an anti-monarchical movement and a movement for equality for the Muslim subjects of the state, um, a movement for uh, democracy and republicanism. Uh, so the idea had always been that Kashmir was an entity in itself and it should continue to be an entity in itself. Um, and the Kashmiri position was that the Maharaja, the ruler of the state, um, he did not have the authority to sign off Kashmir and its people over to India in 1947. That... Um, he was already facing rebellions across the state. There was a very popular uh, movement against uh, the monarchy going on. Um, that uh, the, in fact, the Kashmiri leadership of that time they also claimed that um, he had no legitimacy because his authority in Kashmir was not based uh, on the consent of the people. He was not seen as the benefactor of the population. Rather, instead, uh, his position was contingent upon the British support. And this goes back to 1846 when uh, the British defeated the Sikhs in a war uh, in Punjab. And this chieftain, uh, the Dugra chieftain, uh, Gulab Singh, he chose to um, you know, uh, commit treachery and not side with his overlords, the Sikhs, and decided to leave the battlefield. And in reward of that, the British gave him control over this huge territory, which was at that time the size of the entire Britain you know, which, is, which became the state of Kashmir. And the, it was mutually convenient for the British and the, the Dogra rulers because the Dogras promised that they were going to become a buffer state against the Russian and later Soviet influence in the region. And the British uh, gave them support, claiming, you know, um, and patronage uh, in, in a way where the Dogra rulers did not have to seek consent or any kind of um, you know, legitimacy from the people. So the Dogra rule in Kashmir was supported by the British, which meant the Dogras were a highly exploitative regime. Um, you know, I mean, this is the, those hundred years from 1846 to 1947 is really a blight on the experiences of Kashmiri people. It led to massive uh, dispersion of artisans, peasants, farmers, Kashmiri intellectuals across South Asia. So by 1947, he had absolutely uh, no legitimacy to sign off on, uh, on Kashmir. Um, in 1947, um, the, the popular movement in Kashmir was, as I said, against the Maharaja. Uh, the, um, in, in, in a region south of Kashmir uh, called Jammu, there was a huge massacre carried out by the Maharaja's forces. Um, he was supported by this or new organization that had come up in 1920s, but had become quite popular in northern India, called the RSS, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, and uh, its other organizations like Hindu Mahasabha. 
So the Dogra forces and the Hindu Mahasabha forces together carried out a massacre of the Muslim population of Jammu, forcing close uh, more than 230,000 uh, people um, into the jungles where they were shot uh, and close to the same number who were forced and evicted from uh, their homes and landed in uh, either Pakistani regions of Sialkot or Rawalpindi and uh, in a strip of Kashmir that had become independent called Azad Jammu and Kashmir or Free uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Um, I, I mean, historians would uh, argue that he, they carried out this massacre uh, believing that they were going to lose Kashmir either to Pakistan or to the Free Kashmir fighters. or And so they needed to save Jammu at least for um, India. So they needed to carry out this demographic um, ethnic, ethnic cleansing um, to have Jammu as a Hindu majority region. And in fact, census reports from the region uh, time uh, point straight uh, that Jammu city, for instance, became a Muslim uh, minority uh, city from being a Muslim majority city. Now, all of these are like traumatic events of that time. And um, on, I'm making this argument to claim that the Maharaja had zero legitimacy to sign off Kashmir to India. Um, India promised support to the Maharaja saying that we will come and defend you if you sign this treaty with us. And in October, uh, on October 27, 1947, um, the Maharaja who had run away from his capital in Srinagar signed this treaty. Uh, and um, the day before the Indian forces had uh, invaded and landed in Srinagar, which led to a war between uh, these groups of people who had come from the Northwest province of what became Pakistan, who had a kinship, many of them had heard stories of atrocities going on in Kashmir. Many of them were organized by the nascent Pakistani army. And uh, many of them were uh, perhaps also coming from, you know, that, that region had a history of um, intervention in, in Kashmir. Uh, so that is the beginning of the 1947 war. And a few days later, in November, Pakistani army formally joined the conflict and it led to a stalemate. And by 1948, there was a line drawn through Kashmir called the line of, uh, I mean, it wasn't a line of control at that time, uh, but it was um, a ceasefire line because the U India took the case to the United Nations, um, asking Pakistan to be uh, asked to withdraw the forces. Nehru, the Indian leader, had promise that um, once the conflict was over, there will be a plebiscite. Um, and, um, you know, the UN passed resolution um, um, 47 in 1948, uh, asking for three things. One, that the, there should be an immediate ceasefire. Second, that there should be demilitarization of the entire region. A Pakistani military was supposed to withdraw completely. And uh, India, Indian forces were to keep a very minimal presence only to support the third thing, which was carrying out a plebiscite under UN auspices. Um, India kept saying that they were going to carry out a plebiscite, but in 1950, India passed its, uh, you know, ratified its constitution, and the Article 1 of that constitution claimed Kashmir to be an integral part of India, which was a huge setback to the people of Kashmir, including the, some of the leaders in Kashmir, like Sheikh Abdullah, who had supported um, the, the, the accession to India at that time, because uh, uh, in my understanding of uh, his writings at that time, uh, he perhaps believed that it would have been easier to negotiate a more autonomous or independent status with India than with Pakistan. And there was like this historical rivalry between him and Muslim League leaders where he saw himself as the um, leader of the Muslims of South Asia. Um, now, it, from 1950s to 1953, uh, there was an uneasy period in Kashmir. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah carried out some populist measures, including uh, land reforms, um, <clears throat> which benefited the historically oppressed Kashmiri uh, Muslims and the Dalits, the, who are like the undercast uh, Hindus. And it rattled the Hindu nationalists um, in India, but also the, the feudal Hindu feudal lords who had controlled Kashmir for a century. And in 1953, uh, Nehru government arrested uh, Sheikh Abdullah, claiming that he was conspiring with foreign powers to make Kashmir an independent state. 
Um, um, Sheikh Abdullah, who had meanwhile been kind of working uh, as like a sheath on the Indian, um, you know, uh, knife, had been suppressing um, many pro-Pakistani voices in Kashmir. He had been suppressing any um, any other claimant who would have asked for independence for Kashmir. Um, so from 1953 onwards, when Sheikh Abdullah was arrested, um, the Article 370, which had become part of the Indian Constitution, uh, was eroded. India passed uh, several presidential orders by which India, which was supposed to only control three fat things under the instrument of accession and uh, Article 370 defense, external affairs and communication in the region, um, started to erode all of those things. And um, not only did India begin to control more and more area, arenas of Kashmiri political and economic life, in fact, by 2019, Kashmir had become the most directly controlled um, you know, region in, uh, in, 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 within the Indian sphere. India, Kashmir was more than a union territory by 2019. It was like India historically um, kind of rigged elections, dismissed ob Kashmiri governments arbitrarily, arrested um, uh, you know, Kashmiri opposition, and since 1990 had instituted um, a, 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 you know, a, a, in, a military occupation. Um, I mean, if you- Madam, right, I have to interrupt you. Because your, your time is basically up. If you can just move to wrapping up, we'll yes. get back to the so, discussion. Thank you. Um, so by 1990, uh, Kashmir was a military occupation. And so the events of 2019 were in a way uh, symbolic in the sense that it took away what had already become like an empty shell, the Article 370. Yet, um, India claimed it as a victory for itself. Um, Modi government uh, proclaimed to the Indians that not only could they now go and settle in Kashmir, and, uh, but they could just like take Kashmiri women as wives and whatnot. All of the rhetoric that came out of these fascist forces uh, that now govern India. So I'll just stop my um, comments here and we can like, flesh them out later. Thank you very, very much. And uh, we will we'll be getting back to that. If you uh, have questions or comments, please post them. Uh, and they can be posted in English or French. We are fortunate to have an interpreter uh, and translator. So please make use of that. And I also forgive me for not having introduced Feroz Mehdi, who is with Alternatives Canada. Uh, without whom this panel would not have been able to come together. And I want to thank Farouz uh, for that. My apologies. Our next speaker is Mona Ban. Mona? Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you again, Global Solidarity, for organizing this forum. And thanks, Junaid, for laying it all out. Uh, I know how complicated that history is. And thanks for doing, you know, creating a timeline for us. Um, I'm just going to build on, you know, where uh, Janet left off. Uh, so on August 5th, uh, the BJP government, as we've heard now, headed by Narendra Modi, uh, unilaterally abrogated Articles 370 and 35A of the Indian Constitution to repeal Kashmir's semi-autonomous status and undermine Kashmir's UN-mandated uh, right to self-determination through a free and impartial plebiscite that we've already now heard uh, about from Janet. Most Indian media framed the BJP's uh, forced annexation of Kashmir as, uh, as an important step to correct a seven decade long, quote unquote, historical blunder that had impeded Kashmir's growth and development and promoted separatist sentiments in the valley, which essentially uh, in the Indian uh, psyche means, um, you know, aspirations that demanded freedom from Indian rule and Indian occupation. Despite the fact that Kashmir had routinely performed better compared to other Indian states on many socioeconomic indicators, such as education, poverty, life expectancy, uh, and wealth distribution patterns, thanks to uh, the 1950s land reforms by Sheikh Abdullah that we've also heard uh, about from Janet, um, the myth of Kashmir's underdevelopment has somehow persisted in the Indian consciousness for decades now. While development uh, is a smokescreen for India's occupation of Kashmir, and it has a long history that predates the BJP uh, government um, that took 
control of India in, in 2014. It has a much longer history. But under Modi's regime, it has become an instrument of a demographic war uh, against Kashmir's Muslim majority populations, a project of political and economic integration, as it's called, uh, which is basically, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many Kashmir scholars and journalists, it's really a move to dress up India's war against civilians uh, in a, as a humanitarian project. The abrogation of Articles 370 and 35A, and more recently, the new regulations around the domicile status that we can maybe flesh out later in our conversation, they are meant to facilitate Indian settlements in Kashmir and transform Kashmir Muslims and other uh, minorities in Jammu and Ladakh. Uh, by the way, Ladakh is uh, uh, you know, Buddhist, half Buddhist and half Shia. Uh, there's Shia Muslims in the Kargil region of Ladakh, and there's Hindu Dogras in Jammu, but all of them are essentially uh, going to be turned into disenfranchised minorities in their own, in their homeland. And that's something that's becoming clearer um, as you know, these new policies are enacted. And also there's greater resistance now on the ground, both in Jammu and in Ladakh, which had, there were two provinces that had originally celebrated the abrogation of 35A and 370. So this usurpation of their homes, land, rivers, mountains, and meadows have made long-standing questions about Kashmir's political, economic, and ecological sovereignty even more critical. At the same time, these illegal laws, while trying to render an international dispute uh, as an internal matter, have revealed the hypocrisies of Indian narratives that built a case for the Indian occupation using Kashmir's manufactured dependence on India. For instance, Kashmir's rivers have long been exploited uh, for powering the Indian nation and state for decades. With India's partition, Kashmir's rivers uh, were also divided and turned into hostile borders. The Indus Water Treaty, signed by India and Pakistan, left Kashmiris out of the treaty and divided the eastern and western rivers of the Indus River system, which is a very important uh, river system and uh, really the lifeline of Pakistan in particular. Uh, it divided that between two warring states, but essentially what it did was disenfranchise Kashmiris uh, of their fundamental right to their rivers and to their water bodies. So in recent years, there, there have been rising concerns about a water war between the two nation states with Modi's belligerent rhetoric about unilaterally abrogating the Indus uh, Water Treaty and repurposing dams as instruments of defense and uh, warfare. So uh, this will give you an idea of this kind of dispossession that Kashmiris have experienced because of these dams. It's only 12% of that electricity that is generated by these hydropower dams uh, on Kashmiri rivers that then is supplied back to Kashmir. The rest of it is uh, supplied to the northern grid in India and then distributed to the rest of the country. And yet there's this myth of uh, economic dependence of Kashmir on India that allows uh, many Indians to, um, to pretend that Kashmir needs India to survive, economically at least. While the previous governments invoked development's healing touch uh, to hide the systemic violence uh, of Indian occupation on Kashmiri bodies and landscapes, Modi's development, uh, you see, is couched in this uh, language of Naya Kashmir, which is new Kashmir. It also actually has a longer history because Naya Kashmir was essentially the document that was uh, signed off by Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah, which contained uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, provisions for land distribution that we've heard of already. So he's, so what the Modi government did very uh, tactically was build on this very progressive history of the Naya Kashmir document and, and uh, repurpose it into this uh, document to sanction its settler colonial project in Kashmir. Uh, and what this Naya Kashmir uh, vision of uh, development does, it, it resonates for a lot of people in Kashmir uh, and also for folks in Ladakh and Jammu, it resonates with the threat of depopulation and mass eviction of local populations from their homeland. In the months following the abrogation, uh, and, and, and apart from that, it's also, I think it's been now one year, we have a sense of what's been happening on the ground, and I'm sure Pervez uh, will give us a better sense of uh, exactly that. But from what we know, um, Kashmir's local economy has suffered tremendously. There's been a $5.3 billion financial loss. Hundreds of startups in the beginning and 
even now when there's a 4G internet ban in the region, have suffered huge setbacks uh, because of this communication blackout. They were, un they were unpicked apples that were rotting in orchards in uh, different uh, parts of Kashmir uh, right after the abrogation because it continued. There was this uh, long undeclared curfew that, uh, that went on for months on end and then was followed by this uh, militarized lockdown, which of course uh, became even worse with uh, the COVID-19 uh, clampdown that was superimposed on an already uh, long uh, curfew and shutdown that people were experiencing. In the past few months, the Indian government has encouraged the piecemeal auctioning of Kashmir's land and resources to private Indian investors through online bidding contracts in which Kashmiris cannot participate in the absence of 4G internet connectivity. Indian syndicates are using their uh, quote unquote financial muscle power to outcompete Kashmiris and to utilize the government's 6,000 acre land bank to set up multiplexes, film industries, sorry, film production centers, IT units, medical complexes, and also actually liquor stores, uh, which uh, of course is meant as a way to impose um, or, or assault. Um, it's a cultural assault on people and that's how they're experiencing it. Sand mining of rivers and waterbeds uh, is destroying rivers and fish habitats. Fast there's fast track environmental clearances now that have been put into place. I mean, already uh, based on the work I've been doing, it, already the environmental clearances were not necessarily that rigorous, but now they're non-existent almost. In fact, the military can now uh, you know, acquire land uh, on the basis of strategic interest alone without getting any kind of uh, no objection certificate from the government. So it is sort of this, absolute Im impunity that the military now enjoys acquiring land, which was already, by the way, the case even before uh, August 5th of last year, but it's just now done in a way that is absolutely brazen and uh, for everyone to see and, and celebrate, at least in India. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, what Kashmiris have, of course, experienced are raids and surveillance, as I said, series of militarized lockdowns and deadly encounters in which their homes literally have been razed to ground, and men and women are detained in prisons in Kashmir and outside Kashmir under punitive laws such as uh, the Public Safety Act. There are open FIRs right now uh, against journalists, academics, activists, um, and there is, there is, of course, uh, complete... Um, uh, you know, impunity enjoyed also by the courts uh, who have no responsibility to the rule of law, but of course uh, express deep allegiance, right, to the, to the BJP government at the center. For Kashmiris, however, the rise of Hindu majoritarianism is not necessarily a transformation of India's core values, as argued by many, uh, you know, liberal-minded progressive Indians. Uh, but it simply is a brazen display of what was already a constitutive element of the Indian polity. Earlier Indian regimes held onto Kashmiri territory against people's wishes using a mix of military force and fraudulent elections uh, to silence a Muslim majority region and violently repress their uh, political freedoms. Likewise, India's development interventions, whether framed as benevolent measures to win hearts and minds or to enforce uh, cultural homogeneity, have ended up strengthening India's military occupation of Kashmir and paved the way for India's ongoing settler, project, settler colonial project. Modi government's unabashed proclamation of its settler colonial agenda and the dizzying speed at which it is being carried out reveals that the rhetoric of inclusive and equitable development is a ruse to hide the RSS's. The RSS, by the way, is the, 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 the motherboard of BJP, it is the militant wing of, uh, the, of the BJP. And for long was in fact, uh, you know, declared a terrorist organization in India, but is now of course at the helm of uh, political affairs in the, in the region. So it is part of their uh, larger vision for Kashmir's permanent solution. That's what they call it. It's a permanent solution, which is essentially to rid Kashmir of its Muslim majority and transform it into a predominantly Hindu state. And again, I, I want to reiterate what we heard earlier about how this is not necessarily the first time that this would uh, you know, uh, pan out in history. We already have a precedence uh, through the Jammu massacre in which the demographics of the Jammu region were, tr were transformed uh, from a Muslim majority to a Hindu majority region. Um, and that's what we are also now witnessing. So again, to remember that there are deep continuities between what's happening now and what's happened in the past. 
um, and to keep that in mind as we think about uh, the, the way ahead. If under the Congress, uh, Kashmir, the only Muslim majority state in the Indian Federation, was indispensable for India's existential identity as a secular republic, reconfiguring Kashmir as Hindutva's last frontier is foundational to building a Hindu nation or a Hindu Rashtra. At the time of partition and decades after that, Kashmir represented India's global, even a flawed, uh, reputation as a secular polity, unlike Pakistan, which had chosen to form an Islamic Republic. So there was this sort of moral core to India's uh, global presence, right? Which, uh, and, and, and they used Kashmir right, as a way to affirm their secular credentials as their democratic credentials. This was until the Congress party was in power. But now with the ascent of Hindu uh, majoritarianism in India, Kashmir has become the battleground to redefine the core of Hinduness, as well as India's religious and political identity as a Hindu territory. So what I mean to say is this, that the meanings attached to Kashmir in the Indian imaginary can vary from being a vehicle to tout its secular credentials or as proof of its success in saffronization. Saffronization means Hinduization. Saffron is the color of the Hindu right in India. And what it makes very clear is that India has always depended on Kashmir for its self-definition. Uh, and this kind of takes me back, right, to that earlier point where we've been fed this discourse, at least in India, that Kashmir really needs India for its survival. But we know now it's always been the other way around. Uh, India, in fact, needs Kashmir, unfortunately, for its existential identity. And that's why we had to figure out a way for, uh, for India to be liberated from Kashmir, as, as uh, if, you know, uh, Arundhati Roy also in the past has remarked uh, very eloquently. So the cost is borne by Kashmiris for whom home, habitation, and belonging, particularly after August 2019, have become tenuous categories as they grapple with the aftermaths of new laws that are meant to alter Kashmir's demographics and reconfigure Kashmir as a Hindu homeland. The myth of Kashmir's dependence on India is therefore a delusion nurtured by deep existential crises anchored firmly in India's birth out of a colonial experiment. And we cannot hold Kashmir hostage to uh, this delusion is where I want to end it on. And I think we as a collective uh, globally have to forge ways out of this delusional uh, habitus, out of this delusional space that India has occupied in relation to Kashmir. I'll stop there. Thank you very, very much. And um, we're gonna, uh, I wanna remind Pervez Jamir. Uh, thank you, Bill, and um, thank you, Global Dialogue, for hosting this webinar. Uh, uh, before before I come to the present, I would like to go back a little bit about uh, outside of what's been happening between India and Pakistan, in the sense that uh, ever since the contest over the, uh, the territory of Jammu and Kashmir began in 1947, there's always been a, a very consistent struggle by its residents, uh, who, as Junaid pointed out earlier, used to be known as the, permanent, the, the uh, state subjects of the Dogra monarch uh, for, uh, for, for independence. Earlier, the struggle was, before 1947, the struggle against the monarch was uh, about... Uh, Against the monarchy, and it was it was it was uh, about uh, demand of egalitarian rights and and political and human rights and 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 homeland rights. And after 1947, when India and Pakistan come into picture, and uh, you know a, a contest over the territory begins, the the the, the 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 local struggle takes the shape of resistance to uh, India or Pakistan uh, taking control of the territory, and then. Uh, the resistance against uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the political leaders who were happy aligning with, with India and, and, and became known as, as pro-India. Now, there's a, there's a long struggle of repressing, uh, a long, long history of repressing that, that struggle by, by the local population, the Kashmiri people which uh, went through uh, lots of uh, ups and downs and elections and participation in, in, in elections held by the Indian government in, in Kashmir. And ultimately, uh, it reached a point where uh, the political leaders of that resistance, the resistance leaders, came, 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 to, came to a point where they, they thought there was, there was 
no space within the democratic setup that India had uh, established in Kashmir and offered to uh, to, to the territory to, uh, in which to work uh, within for for uh, securing rights of the people. So the struggle turns militant, and you have a you have an armed uh, rebellion that 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 uh, erupts in the territory uh, around nineteen uh, late nineteen eighties. And that's when a, an Indian military campaign begins, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to crush this. Basically, uh, this was centered around two demands. Fundamentally, uh, because there is a UN mandated uh, plebiscite that was supposed to be held, like Jonathan and Mona talked about it earlier, uh, uh, talking about the political history of the place. And there was also a demand for making Kashmir a free nation again. So. Uh, in response to that, India uh, began a, a very harsh, brutal military campaign that resulted in enforced disappearances, killings, destruction of property, people arrested, uh, you know, thrown into jails, dissent criminalized, and ultimately uh, began to be uh, the, the entire political struggle for political rights in Kashmir began to be described in India by by the Indian state and who agree with it uh, as as a terrorist movement. So uh, and and during this entire uh, military campaign and the insurgency in Kashmir, there was a, uh, there was uh, there was also a spawning of a political class, which which many people refer to as client regimes that that New Delhi uh, always uh, supported. And through which uh, elections were held to, uh, you know, generate this impression that there is there is a there, there is a democracy at work in Kashmir. But uh, uh, there's also a parallel history of those elections having been rigged, and the and the most notable one among that was the one just before uh, you know 1989 when the armed rebellion uh, erupted uh, in the territory, which is patently rigged, where. Uh, Muslims of Kashmir had formed a politi political alliance and decided to uh, fight the elections under the auspices of Indian uh, Election Commission. But the, the, the rigging was so brazen, to give you one example of that, that you know, uh, people who were uh, winning and in the counting centers were declared as having won and they were successful candidates, were immediately thrown into jails and uh, then there's a, there's a long story of how they were tortured and how they then, then, then came out of jails and became uh, the nucleus of the armed rebellion that is, that, that is still continuing. So that phase of the last 30 years is when, uh, when a new, uh, new regime of suppressing uh, political expression in Kashmir began and it it became it became militarized, and the territory also became so highly militarized. Now it's 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 many call it the world's most militarized zone. You have about anything between five hundred thousand and seven hundred fifty thousand uh, Indian soldiers deployed in the part of the territory controlled by India alone. So you can imagine what that that results in, and alongside as this military campaign to counter the insurgency and the Kashmiri political assertion. Uh, the insurgency has been very, very popular. To counter it, um, elections uh, began to be held again, and elections were revived as a military project. I remember in 1996, the first election of the insurgency erupted in India. It was an out-and-out -out brazen military project in the sense that the soldiers went into the homes, dragged Kashmiri people out of their homes, and forced them to vote. And threatened them that if, if, if you don't see uh, the, 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 the indelible voters mark on your finger in the evening, there'll be consequences. So elections were resurrected as a means of re-establishing Indian legitimacy in Kashmir in, 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 in the eyes of the world. So a lot of a lot of military coercion, military suppression, bribe, and uh, uh, expansion of a political client class began to take shape in Kashmir and people uh, kept kept responding to that. And now uh, it, it reached a point when, when nothing was working and it changes course when the current regime, the, the uh, BJP government led by uh, Narendra Modi came into power 
things began to change. The uh, the uh, the alibis of the, the that 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 Kashmir has a democracy and uh, a terrorist movement is scuttling it began to change. And uh, uh, there were there were attempts by the BJP to take power directly. You know, uh, the BJP has never never ruled Kashmir as a political party. There have been the Congress party earlier has has, has ruled Kashmir. Uh, you know, in the, in the local government, other parties have. And there have been local parties like the National Conference, the People's Democratic Party, that came in came in later. But this was an attempt by the BJP to take power. And in the in the in the elections of the 2008, the, the mandate was split uh, almost midway, and BJP and the People's Democratic Party came together. And before that, you know, because uh, the People's Democratic Party was talking about uh, the uh, in some way, rights of the people to be restored within the constitution of India. So they fought against the BJP. And uh, and then the, the, the verdict was such that they decided it was best to uh, come together with BJP and form a government. So at that time, something critical happens in Kashmir. At that time, whatever, there, there, there used to be a, an entire spectrum of opinion there would be some people who would say that our Kashmir's future lies with Pakistan. Some would say that a negotiated better future with India is better, of which uh, they found some representation in, in, in the political articulation of the People's Democratic Party. And But, but, but the majority of uh, people suspected this alliance. And what, what happened as a result was that something that I call the middle ground, in which all pro-India politics played out, was almost completely annihilated, and by the time uh, uh, you know that 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 government lost power because because BJP uh, you know uh, withdrew support to the People's Democratic Party for the local government, uh, things had transformed in a significant way uh, in this in the sense that uh, the legitimacy of what could happen within the electoral space or within the Indian constitution, what Indian constitution offered, completely uh, finished. So now it was already a situation where there was nothing between the Indian state and the Kashmiri people who were uh, struggling for a right to self-determination. And then uh, with that, with when that happened, there was very little room for anything else except what what India was trying to do in terms of completely integrate or assimilate or annex Kashmir into India, or there was resistance to it, which said merger with Pakistan or 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 independence for Kashmir. So, in that background, the events of August five happened. But what's been happening since then is an intensification of repression and military repression and rights violations and denial of political free political expression has intensified to another level uh, now uh, expressing political opinion freely about the fact that kashmir is a disputed territory and there is a struggle for right to self determination happening stands criminalized uh, and uh, people now feel totally unprotected because earlier, because of the Article 370 and Article 35A of the Indian Constitution that Mohan and Junaid referred to, offered some protection in terms of the homeland rights to land and to resources and to uh, and, and, and access to government jobs. Now that protection is gone. There is a uh, what that has done is it has uh, it has created a, 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 a you know a the scenario in which I, I particularly sense, you know, from our side, it might look that look like that Kashmir is now silent. People are not responding to what's been done since uh, August 5 of 2019. But I personally think that, you know, uh, my, my work takes me to places across the territory. I personally think that there's a, people are in a, in a meditative mode of protest, because the, uh, the the protections to the homeland rights have gone now. Now uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a moment of meditative protest that that, that I, I I would I would describe it as. And uh, you, 
we don't know uh, how, how, how it's going to how it's going to pan out because on the ground people are losing rights fast people are losing livelihoods fast people are losing any sense of security very fast it's a it's a uh, a sense of you know it's it's like it's like a, it's like you know kashmiri people are feeling like like a baby without any any protection at all out there under the elements in the open so that's the state of uh, the ground at the moment thank you very very much um so we are at a point now where we're going to uh get into some questions that i'm going to pose but also questions that you the listeners have raised and um I, I, uh, I, I'm just going to kick it off with a question that has perplexed me. The, um, the struggle around Jammu and Kashmir globally, and this relates to That's something so that you were raising, Pradesh, uh, yeah. has been raised in, to a great extent as a conflict between India and Pakistan. And the independence movement, the movement for self-determination that you mentioned, actually gets very little media attention. And I contrast that with, let's say, the Palestinian movement, which once upon a time was described as the Arab-Israeli conflict, but then clearly became the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. Why is it that in the case of, of Kashmir, there seems to continue to be this framing of this as being India versus Pakistan? And I'll, whoever would like to respond to that. Um, let me try to, I mean, one is uh, very clear, like unlike in the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, where at the beginning, at least, the uh, relative power between the Israelis and the Palestinians with their Arab allies was not so huge. Um, and the Arab voices, and Palestinian voices were quite uh, had been historically quite prominent. Um, and thirdly, the fact that Israel was seen as having a more direct connection to the West. Um, these were factors that kind of like made Palestine. And I mean, we know for sure, like until 1990s, the Oslo Accords Palestinian movement was also primarily seen as a terrorist movement. Uh, and after that, it became quite prominent first in the US campuses and um, else, and then it has kind of entered uh, the political consciousness. I mean, I just also want to say that, you know, uh, just because these Kashmir is not known in the West doesn't mean it says something more about the West than about the Kashmir issue itself. Um, uh, in case of Kashmir, Kashmir has been overdetermined by the, the these two giant states, India and Pakistan. Um, it uh, the once the British left, they kind of had nothing to do with it. Although Kashmir was uh, a remnant of the colonial legacy, the, the conflict there was a result of British leaving fast, British dividing the con subcontinent, the British not uh, kind of taking responsibility for the depredations that they had left in the subcontinent for close to two centuries. Um, so. And with the sheer numbers, you know, um, there are 15 million Kashmiris in Kashmir and around the world. Our voices are small. Our voices aren't too loud. And we are faced with uh, 1.2 billion Indians who are, you know, uh, who uh, accept the government, the, the um, Modi government line or the Congress government line, hook, line and sinker. So um, what you hear is not the Indian position, which is based in reason and rationality, based in ethics, but simply a lot a noise through which the voices of reason within India or Pakistan or in Kashmir uh, are rarely heard. But my sense is that if more people came to understand the, what is at stake in Kashmir in terms of global peace, in terms of how the interests of everybody on the planet are tied to the peaceful and just resolution of the Kashmir issue, I think a lot more people would be interested. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, oh, oh, go ahead, Mama. No, no I, I just, it's also, I think, going back to an earlier point, um, I, I mentioned it's also because India has, uh, uh, to a large extent successfully thus far, been able to cultivate this image of uh, itself as a secular democracy, even mm. though, of course, uh, 
it was uh, hardly a democracy in Kashmir ever, right? Starting from 1947 onwards. Um, I think what helped India, unfortunately, is the global war on terror and how it was able to latch itself on uh, that you know, global discourse against uh, terror um, and then conflate the struggles of self-determination in uh, Kashmir with uh, the global, uh, you know, alliance against uh, terrorism and so on and so forth. So I think all that helped India uh, sort of cement its position as a global leader of anti-terrorism and democracy and so on and so forth. I think this is sort of an opportune moment, even though a lot has happened this year, as Parvez mentioned, and and and, and Kashmiris really feel um, in many ways, they are in this sort of, as he said, this meditative state of protest. But at the same time, I think what's happened very uh, clearly in the past few months is the international attention has been focused on Kashmir, also because of India's losing um, this sort of frazzled now image of, uh, of uh, or this sort of clearer um, framing of India as a Hindu fascist state, right? Not just an emerging one, but probably one that has already arrived. Uh, so I think that the, the global configuration is shifting in many ways. And I, I, I really do think, uh, going back to the points already made by Janet, that this is a moment for the world to reckon with the centrality of Kashmir to global politics of justice, uh, decolo uh, decolonialism, and uh, solidarity. Um, so this is, if this is not a moment we capture fully, then we will have lost a very important uh, moment in history. Parvez, did you want to add to that? You're on mute. You're on mute. Like, like I, was, I, I, I was trying to talk about elections earlier. You, you see, uh, uh, New Delhi has always successfully managed to tell the world that there is some democracy at play in Kashmir. And it was displayed mostly through regular elections that were managed in that place. But... Uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 residents, the Kashmiri people themselves, have been always saying that these 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 elections are uh, uh, held using what they call client regimes and through coercion and bribe and and, and elections have been a military project. But uh, New Delhi has succeeded in uh, telling the world that these this was democracy at play, despite the fact that uh, you know. The uh, campaigns for local elections would always talk about uh, these are elections about local day-to-day -day governance issues. But when the elections would be over, it would always be interpreted and uh, marketed to the world, as it were, by New Delhi as a Kashmiri referendum in favor of India. While as that was never the choice, these were elections for, let's say, larger municipal rights elections. Nothing, nothing more than that. So, but 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 that that narrative that narrative had uh, suffered majorly by the time uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, an armed rebellion uh, was uh, you know erupted on the scene. But then there were big efforts to resurrect that, but but it was not happening. Now there was also uh, when BJP comes to uh, power in Delhi, it becomes a Kashmir doesn't only remain as uh, something to be sh shown to the world where democracy is at work and 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 whatever people are saying doesn't deserve to be paid any attention to, but they because of its ideological background uh, that that comes from the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh, the RSS, like Mona had mentioned, it needed to show its own power base in India that we get Kashmir as, as this uh, head of the nation, uh, a figurative head of the nation that, that, they, that they see as uh, a deity and Kashmir becomes a head of it and that had to be assimilated again. So they did not, they did not bother about going the so-called electoral or democratic way about it. They decided to quote unquote annex it and uh, without caring about the rights of the people. But in the process, what happened? The way they did it, the brutal way they did it, by imposing a military siege and a total communications blockade and by arresting every possible influential voice from the entire spectrum of resistance to Indian rule to the pro-Indian uh, political forces, they just locked up everyone. And I guess at least the, the global, the Western press took note 
if the governments have not responded so far, but but I think this was perhaps for the first time that, that in, in such an unprecedented, emphatic way, the international press took note of what was happening was perhaps wrong for the first time. And uh, the, the, the older narrative of democracy at work in Kashmir was, was uh, uh, you know, completely, almost completely finished off, at least in the, in the, in the mainstream press spaces. Now, um, uh, I mean, Kashmiris, because of that, feel a lot vindicated about what their struggle has been and how it did not get represented or reported well in the, in the, in the, in the global mainstream press. But now it is rest, it, it, it's reached a point for uh, people living in Kashmir that, well, okay, is somewhere in the, uh, in, the, in the Western press, what is happening here on the ground in reality begins to get taken note of in a substantial way. But now what about the governments in the world? Governments seem to be still uh, held up in the India-Pakistan binary about Kashmir and not that. I, I personally see nothing changing there much. Uh, thank you. Mona, one of the uh, viewers uh, asked the following question. They said that um, they were interested in you uh, elaborating on a point that you made that India has an existential dependence on Kashmir and needs to be liberated from it. What did you mean by that? You're on mute. Right, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I think what I meant to say, and that's something Parvez actually has fleshed out a little bit uh, in his response to that earlier question. What I meant was, um, so for the longest time, uh, India's claim on Kashmir uh, was to uh, present itself uh, to its own self, but also to the international community as a secular republic. Right? So secularism was something that India was very proud of, especially because, you know, Pakistan had not decided to go that route. Uh, so to uh, sort of claim that spot as a secular democracy, you had to have Kashmir because uh, it was the only Muslim majority state in that Indian uh, sphere. Right. Uh, so as the only Muslim majority state in uh, the Indian context, what role did Kashmir then play? Right. But to help. Indian and Indians feel good about their secular credentials. That's what I meant insofar as, uh, you know, Indians, uh, Indian insistence on Kashmir as uh, its integral part is concerned under this more sort of quote unquote liberal Congress regime, right? Now what's happened is, and it's again, it's not necessarily something that's happened just now that the RSS is uh, finally kind of uh, woken up to this reality that they need Kashmir in order to uh, fulfill their ideological project of seeing India uh, as Bharat, as Akhand Bharat, which means, you know, and, and sort of an eternal, an eternal integral country, right, which can trace its existence to uh, 5,000 years ago, right, as a civilizational entity. And for that to happen, the RSS for the longest time, uh, from the 1920s onwards, has seen Kashmir, right, as part of this larger entity called Bharat, or Bharat being uh, sort of this, uh, uh, you know, an, uh, a land of antiquity, a land of Hindu antiquity. So what I'm trying to say then, what I was trying to say is, uh, so while on the one hand, Kashmir served the purpose of India representing itself as secular under, under the Congress, now, the, the tide is completely turned where secularism is, of course, not a valued ethic for the BJP government, right? They call secular people secular. That is uh, the sort of uh, troll language that they have devised very successfully, uh, trying to show secular people down by calling them sick, by calling them demented, by calling them pathological. So the turn is complete, right, insofar as Kashmir's status in the in this uh, ideology and a territorialization of the Akhand Bharat is concerned. So Kashmir now represents, right, a very important, uh, Himalayas in on the, I mean, um, on a larger scale, it's the Himalayas themselves that are seen as Hindu. They're seen as primordially Hindu, right? And Kashmir is seen as primordially Hindu too. And therefore they need to retain that control over Kashmir in order to, uh, in order to, uh, 
portray uh, portray india or bharat as a viable entity historically civilizationally as well as politically does that make sense indeed absolutely uh, I just yeah. to quickly add something to this um look um this question of secular india and hindu india to me um is there is a change that has taken place over the last uh, 30 years um but uh, we have to understand that india as it emerged in 1947 and it was as it was imagined by the elite indian national leaders was a uh, kind of like um, the inheritor of the british empire so india was the inheritor of british empire and they saw pakistani you know the muslim league demand for pakistan as a secessionist movement from this organic totality that was uh, supposed to be india now um under the the rhetoric of secularism which in india was uh, limited by definition to uh, equidistance from all religions not in how it may be understood in different contexts and the hindu idea of hindus being the first citizens privileged citizens versus the muslims who must continuously express their loyalty to india to be um you know have, have the right to live in india between that there is this continuity between the territorial imagination of the state uh the secular indian leaders and the hindu nationalist le- leaders all had uh, the same idea of india the territorial geography of india whether they called it a secular india or a hindu india did not really matter in fact the secular leadership had borrowed this idea actually from um uh, you know the hindu nationalists um and uh, if you look at kashmir from that perspective you can see that kashmiri struggle has been an anti imperial struggle i mean and uh, in that kashmiris are not alone you, you uh, in the region which is now called northeast india um, people have been struggling against this imperial idea of india since 1947 in um, central parts of india the no, the indigenous communities indigenous peoples have been struggling against this idea of imperial india which is the idea controlled by the dominant castes the upper caste the brahmins um and the elites who um, have you know only changed their definition changed their skins from like this equidistance from religion uh, under congress regime to uh, this explicitly brazen muscular hindu nationalist india so uh, i mean we have to have this territorial clarity of why kashmir is seen as essential to india it is not simply about i mean i take agree with this point of self image of india yes india india's diplomacy is very different from its internal politics now they do not match often what indian leaders tell their people in india is completely different from what they tell diplomats and foreign press in india the indian leaders tell their people that we have to crush kashmiris we have to crush the nagas we have to crush the adivasis because they are uh, they are internationals um but for the foreign governments the indian government says look we have managed to contain this plurality within this uh, territory that we have um so that those things need to keep to be kept in mind to understand what india means by its secularism you know thank you um one more sort of background question was raised by one of the viewers and then i'd like to switch gears in the interest of time to talk about where do we go from here what are the possible solutions and a few viewers have written comments about that but the the question is about the indian left and where how has the indian left responded over time and i don't mean the congress party uh forces to the left of the congress party how have they responded to the question of uh, jammu and kashmir and uh yeah let's whoever would like to start there i mean uh, let me first begin by talking about kashmiri left you know um indian left is not just the only entity um that you know uh, can you know represent the leftist idea in the subcontinent there is there are many other leftist uh, forces and have historically been in 1947 the kashmiri left was quite ecstatic that um kashmir was going to become independent um and the in- indian invasion through this poke in the wheel for them and the socialist party in kashmir actually uh, out of frustration said that we should rather join pakistan than become part of india 
Um, Indian left, as you know, we know f- um, historically um, across the world, left has been factional. There have been many groups within the left, and Indian left is um, no stranger to that. Um, there are there is the the CPM, which emerged out of CPI, and there are these groups that came out of the Naxalite uh, rebellion in um, in the seventies, early seventies. Um, they have all held different position. The CPI, CPM have had the establishment position on Kashmir, um, basically claiming Kashmir to be an independent, uh, to be integral part of India. Um, to, I mean, part of the reason is that these formations uh, have historically been controlled by the Brahminical upper castes, who's, who see their um, kind of in, uh, interests tied with the those who control BJP or with uh, in, in Congress. But this is not to say that uh, in terms of what they would like to happen in Kashmir, you know, is the same as what the BJP would like to happen. Um, they would like to see perhaps not so much of a crackdown, even though they they've been in power. Uh, CPM was part of several coalitions in the uh, ni- mid '90s, and their policies in Kashmir were no different from uh, those of uh, the Congress or the later BJP. They were uh, they used the same militaristic policies. Um, you know, uh, in fact. Uh, one of the last uh, major leaders of that uh, CPM, our Krishan Singh Surjit, called asked that India and Pakistan should use what they call the China formula, um, which was that they should put Kashmir in a cold storage. We should not talk about Kashmir at all, and we should just like have peace, um, kumbaya between the two of us. Um, but the more uh, Naxalite left. Uh, from CPIML and especially the 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 the, C, uh, the 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 insurgent left, which has been fighting Indian forces, have a more or less clear position. Especially the Naxalites, they ask, they call for the right to self determination of Kashmiris. Um, the CPIML has asked for uh, kind of like Kashmiri, you know, democracy and decency within the Indian realm, which to me is. Uh, Kind of very close to what Congress has demanded, and not much different from that. Um, I just want to make one quick point, though, that it's a failure of the Indian left's imagination um, that it has made itself irrelevant to, on so many social political issues within India, um, because it has tied itself to this territorial idea of India as a nation. It has always played second fiddle to Indian uh, nationalism, the framing of which was set up by Congress and which has been kind of accentuated by the BJP. Like Mona said, that India needs to liberate itself from uh, the idea of, you know, disabuse itself from that it needs to control Kashmir. CPI and CPM and the mainstream left in India also needs to disabuse itself of this uh, territorial nationalist vision of India to become relevant. Thank you. Um, other comments, uh, responses to that question before we move on? We have about 15 minutes. I, I'd like to, I mean, it's not really about the left uh, per se, but it is part of how the left has uh, uh, framed uh, the Kashmir issue as a human rights issue alone, right? So they are uh, okay insofar as uh, India's, uh, I- India maintains its human rights, um, a clean human rights record. Um, so, but but one thing I think the left also needs to perhaps come to terms with is also this discourse on human rights insofar as it's used by, uh, let's say, the human rights, uh, the United Nations, um, you know, human rights commissioner's office. They don't see human rights of Kashmiris uh, divorced from their fundamental right of self-determination. So the right of self-determination, and this is, I'm saying this based on the report of 2018 that came from their office that very clearly stated that Kashmiri human rights uh, included their right to self-determination. So the idea here that you can somehow talk about, you know, upholding Kashmiri human rights, but do so within the constitutional framing of the India Indian uh, nation state is deeply flawed because that's not necessarily how uh, international bodies such as the UN that, of course, have a legal political stake in ensuring that uh, you know the Kashmiri right to self-determination is uh, is fulfilled at some point, uh, 
you know, in, in the near future, uh, they do not necessarily see the two as opposing categories. So you cannot on the one hand claim that what, uh, as, as the left does, that we're only interested in maintaining, safeguarding human rights and not support the right to self-determination that is a fundamental right granted to Kashmir through uh, UN interventions right from 1947 onwards. Um, does that make sense? And, and the other, the other question, uh, the other important point here is to also recognize that the Indian judiciary, right? That of course the left had a lot of uh, a hope in, um, for pay, maybe good reason, because you know the Supreme Court for a while, uh, at least you know a decade ago, was seen as a very reformist organization, a very sort of active organi organization that defended people's rights and so on and so forth. So there was some sort of element of hope that the Supreme Court would deliver when it came to Kashmir, it would uh, safeguard human rights of Kashmiris, their fundamental rights, so on and so forth. But the problem is that the Supreme Court has never ever played that part for Kashmiri. The judiciary, the Indian judiciary, has always only cemented uh, the Indian occupation of Kashmir and actually upheld it through its many statutes, through its many decisions. I mean, one of the um, most controversial decision uh, to hang of Zulguru, uh, who was uh, a Kashmiri, you know, um, indicted in terror charges, when he was, and then without due uh, process, when he was hanged to death, uh, the Supreme Court turned around and said it was to satisfy India's national or collective consciousness, right? Or conscience, sorry. India's collective conscience had to be satisfied and therefore we had to sacrifice this Kashmiri at the altar of, you know, India's democracy. So I think we have to also recognize the limits of constantly uh, putting Kashmir within the constitutional judicial embed of uh, India. And that's why for Kashmiris, there is no hope but international recourse. The only hope, of course, is that you know, the Indian civil society will finally rise up and recognize that uh, Kashmir is not a national issue. It's an international issue and needs to be dealt with in the framework of international law. I think that's the thing that needs to happen next. Uh, Professor, can I quickly, quickly add to yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I was going to ask you a question, but go ahead. Sure. Well, I wanted to use what Mona was saying as a segue into where do we go from here? Um, there's a number of questions that have been posed by listeners and viewers that really speak to that, including uh, that various forms of resistance have been attempted. How do you evaluate it? Uh, what is the role of Pakistan in all this? One viewer basically said, in essence, isn't it inevitable that it will be settled one way or the other, i.e. going to Pakistan or going to India. So actually, I wanted to ask you to, to jump in on this. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to speak to the question of where, where does it go from here, but I can say that uh, from uh, the uh, constitutional legal remedial framework available to Kashmiris and, 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 and their demands and, 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 uh, and, and the violations of their rights, right, from human rights to political rights and everything else. And, and now, now denial of uh, exclusive homeland, homeland rights. The, the available framework of the Indian constitution that's on offer is inadequate and unless uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would imagine uh, it's subjected to international law. I don't. I don't know how how anything anything can move forward. And 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 if I if my reading the ground over the years has been has been correct, that is precisely what the people on the ground are demanding. They're saying that uh, you know uh, uh, the uh, application of Indian constitution and Indian rules and the and the resolution of the Indian Parliament about Kashmir have only resulted in uh, loss of rights and loss of lives and loss of uh, uh, sovereignty and, and everything else. And uh, it, sh it, should, it should be looked at from outside the ambit of the Indian constitution. And uh, that is what, uh, that's what many of the uh, rights groups working on the ground have also been demanding that whatever has happened, particularly in the last 30 years of insurgency and the counter-insurgency military campaign that India has unleashed there, which has been, which has been very brutal in, in, in more ways than one, uh, cannot be held unless, unless Kashmir is brought into the ambit of the international law. Well, well let's go, Janad, to you. Um, and, uh, and then I want to move towards ending uh, with uh, uh, Mona. In terms of the same question, I mean, I, among other things, I want to know 
I mean, is there, you know, Mona raised the issue of the making uh, further internationalizing this issue. I mean, do we need some sort of global boycott, divestment, sanctions movement to support Kashmiri sovereignty? Are there other things that can be done? Um, see, I, of course, support uh, all kind of pressure that can be put on the actors right now in the subcontinent that are keeping uh, Kashmiris from having uh, their sovereignty and their right to self-determination. Those could take multiple forms. Of course, every organic struggle uh, begins with, um, you know, conscience, conscientious people uh, taking up important global causes. Now, um, I know there's a vibrant movement in Kashmir. That's not going to go away. I mean, uh, if the Modi government thinks just by taking these things, they've tried to use extreme military pressure on Kashmiris for 70 years now, and it has not gone away. In fact, more and more younger Kashmiris are becoming part of the movement. And if not to, you know, taking to the streets, but in terms of their con uh, consciousness. Um, look, uh, Robert Kaplan, this American um, uh, geographer, argued that geography is fate and whatnot. One of the reasons why globally people believe that, oh, there is no solution, is because we are this territory that is, you know, surrounded by three major nuclear powers. Um, now, uh, yes, it is a fact that there are there is India, Pakistan, and China controlling parts of what historically was Kashmir, but it should also be become the basis for the urgency which Kashmir demands because we are a tender box. Tender box, you know, we could uh, it could explode any time. Kashmir, we, geography does not have to be fate. Uh, geographies are made volatile by uh, interested forces and. Uh, Indian actions in particular, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, China and Pakistan have been completely innocent here, but Indian actions in particular since 1947, then in 1962, uh, 1980s, and the 2020, I mean, many people in the world perhaps don't know that there's an, um, an active state of almost, you know, a war going on, on the, what is the, uh, the border between India and China in Ladakh region right now. And the military forces are getting built up. And uh, there's so much, I mean, there's been a continuous state of conflict on between India and Pakistan along the border uh, in, in Kashmir. And in fact, it's spilling down to the Punjab border as well, where uh, clashes have happened in, in more recent times. So we are, Kashmir can become a bridge of peace for this region, because a lot of things are happening in terms of trade and development and building of infrastructure, but it can also become the place where, you know, you know, something awful is gonna happen that will lead to destruction all around. And uh, so I think that that's what I, I would say, that my hope is that people recognize that the Kashmir's position in that region uh, can become very volatile, is already volatile and can spiral out of control any moment and we can turn it around. Thank you. Mona, I wanna give you the final word uh, for a couple of minutes and then wanna to move towards wrapping up our session. I mean, I, I think um, I'd like to say one thing. I, I agree with whatever has been said about uh, Kashmir's volatility, not just being a domestic problem, not just being a local problem, but a global problem. And I also want to point out that we're here talking about an ecologically uh, important zone, right? So it's not just a political issue, it's an ecological issue. So for those detractors, for those fence-sitters who think Kashmir is out there uh, with, and has no ramifications for global politics, I do want to insist that people see this as an unfolding environmental uh, uh, catastrophe, right? Which is going to impact places beyond uh, the subcontinent, not, not just India, Pakistan, China, uh, Afghanistan and so on and so forth, but places as far as Europe, places as far as the US. So I do want to insist that uh, if for nothing, uh, but only to save the ecology and the environment, the global ecology and environment, people need to treat it as a moment for environmental justice as well, as much as it is a moment for political and economic and um, uh, social justice. Uh, and I think we cannot separate ecological catastrophe in the region, from its political uh, incidents and from its political uh, lineage, right? Or its political fallout. So I, I do uh, wish that people would pay, start paying closer attention to, if they haven't already, 
to the kind of ecological collapse that we are, uh, that's imminent to me uh, at this point, uh, unfortunately, given what we're now faced with here in California, for example, as I speak, but also, I mean, I don't know how many people know this, but the Himalayan glaciers are retreating and that's going to cause a lot of problems, right? For these warring nation states that depend on those uh, glacial waters uh, to run their, uh, to, to, to live, right? To run their economies. Um, to exist. So I think um, it's very, very important that a lot of international pressure from civil society groups, from international lobby groups, and from uh, other states is put on India, Pakistan, and China to recognize the Kashmiri right to self-determination and pay equal attention to Kashmir, if not more. I think Kashmiris, their voices need to be front and center in trying to resolve this crisis. Um, and that's what I want to end on. Well, I want to thank you each. And uh, before uh, wrapping up, just a couple of things. One of the things that I want to encourage the, the listeners to really ponder is that we've entered a moment where uh, we're seeing the growth of right-wing populist regimes around the planet that are displaying an absolute audacity when it comes to dismissing international and domestic law. Uh, whether it is the uh, Israeli aggression against the Palestinians or the discussion that we've had here about what's going on uh, under the BJP vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir, or uh, you, you can go on and on. Look at what Turkey is doing. Um, and, and one of the problems with that is that aggression and violation of law becomes normalized, that we begin to think, well, this is just the way it is. And this is the way it is unless there's resistance. And I think that uh, what the panel has said very clearly is that let resistance be our watchword, uh, that there's no room for complacency uh, in this situation. And I want to thank our panelists, Mona Ban, Pervez Bukhari, Mohammed Junaid. I want to thank Global Dialogue, and uh, Feroz Mekti, without, without whom this would not have been possible. Uh, there will be a, a second panel uh, on, on the Kashmir uh, that will be on August 29th. Uh, and there is a Facebook event that's been posted by Global Dialogue on it. I want to encourage people to uh, participate. It will be a different panelist and a different moderator. Uh, and, uh, but I think it's, I think despite that, it's going to be quite good. Um, and so I really want to encourage everyone to, to, to view that if you have the opportunity. Um, and my apologies that we weren't able to get to all of the questions that were raised, try to get to a number of them. But as you know, the time vanished. Uh, so anyway, in either case, again, my thanks to the panelists. Thanks to you, uh, the listeners and viewers. And um, have a good and safe rest of your day and weekend. Thank Take you. care. Pleasure.